welcome to the studios Paint Tube TV. I'm very pleased to have you with me today. So thank you for coming and joining me for this presentation. It's wonderful to have you join me. You know, we spend so much of our painting careers by ourselves uh, in isolation, um, what I call solitary refinement, that it's uh, a lot of fun and rewarding to have you here. I hope I can contribute to your uh, to your uh, creative process and your creative journey. Y it's your choice how you choose to participate today. If you'd like to simply just watch and listen, that would be fine. If you'd like to keep a notepad and pencil nearby for jotting down notes, things that might be of some significance or importance, maybe some keys that, uh, that uh, discoveries that you learn while we're together here. Uh, or lastly, if you want to hit the pause button and set up your gear and paint along because Ultimately, that's where uh, the learning comes from. You know, we all love to read about painting and we all lo love to look at art books and watch videos and demos and chat with other artists, but mainly it comes down to us just being there and uh, applying the paint. It's the easel hours. So, uh, since you're with me, I'm going to assume you know that I'm Don Demers. Um, I will share with you a little bit about my background that you may or may not know. Um, I'm primarily known as a marine painter slash seascape painter. I think that's the reason you're here watching because you're interested in painting the sea and water and all of its uh, various aspects. Um, however, my career actually started as an illustrator and uh, I worked in illustration for many years. Uh, book publishers, magazine publishers, advertising agencies, corporations, institutions, uh, and it was very rewarding, it was very demanding, but the thing that I really gleaned from it the most was my skill set. Uh, I was asked to paint or draw any and everything. You never knew what kind of assignment it was going to come. So I really developed my pictorial skills. I learned how to uh, address a rectangle, to organize elements within a page. That page, that rectangle correlates to our canvases. We are dedicated to a rectangle. Even though we're taking our inspiration from a great big wide world, we are attempting to capture a piece of it uh, on canvas. Um, so from illustration, during illustration I was simultaneously working on my marine paintings, primarily narrative marine paintings, historic in nature, vessels at sea, harbors, uh, and I slowly eventually migrated toward uh, landscape after having been devoted to marine painting and seascape painting for some time. Um, I began to get the desire to step outside, reintroduce myself to painting on location. And that was about 25 years ago. Uh, upon that decision, my artistic world opened right up. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. Being interested in plein air painting, landscape, seascape, uh, you uh, go to new places, you meet new people, you develop friendships, you have a wide array of places from which to learn uh, people and places. In my particular case, I'm from New England, still live there, but I was given the opportunity to paint out west, paint in the mountains, paint in the deserts, uh, as far west as Hawaii, and in the opposite direction, as far east as Europe, where I've painted in many locations, and even down south uh, in the United States, many places, the Panhandle, Texas, um, these, uh, Georgia, the Carolinas, so what that does is it heightens your, your skills of observation. Uh, it builds a body of experience with diversity in it, which is very helpful. Um, so that has brought me to present. Um, along the way, toward, during that journey, uh, instructing uh, became part of my career. Not something I necessarily planned, but it began to happen and I was told I was effective at it. I very much enjoy it being with people and getting to know them and sharing this passion that we all have. Uh, so that brings us here to the studio in this demonstration today on, uh, for, based on a painting called The Coming Light. Uh, the primary theme of the demonstration is moving water and we'll discuss this as I'm painting it. Uh, discuss it at length both scientifically and visually. Um, I'm not going to make any secret of the fact that I've got notes here that I'm going to uh, follow I, I need to uh, follow because I want to be thorough. I want to make sure I don't miss anything uh, in the presentation. I work in a very sequential, chronological, methodical way. 
uh, and I want to present that to you while we're here together. So the couple of comments to make about the themes of this um, uh, painting presentation before we begin. Um, I've got three agendas. Uh, one is to introduce the concepts and the um, elements and the foundations of painting. Uh, if you already have a pretty good grasp on them, my second agenda is to reinforce those principles and concepts of uh, the foundations of painting. And lastly, I'll share with you, obviously, how it is I go about it. Uh, that's the least important. It's very important that you, uh, that we're able to share that commonality that we have is that we're all obligated to understand the architecture of painting and how to put a painting together on that white rectangle that we all have to face every time we take out our, our materials and begin to and have the desire to create something. Um, I don't think of painting as an art. I think of it as a craft. Um, if you become accomplished enough in that craft, uh, a competent or fluent, that will give you the opportunity to make art. But first you have to know the craft and they'll, we'll discuss that at length. Most of our creative painting careers, lives, are built up of the how and the why. And we all love the how. How do you paint an apple? How do you capture that tree? How do you paint the, that reclined figure? And we study it and we go seek out teachers and we practice and all of that is based on the how. And right up to this day, and I've been painting all my life since I was a boy, um, I'm still involved. How am I gonna tackle that? Uh, and regardless of what it is, is it a drawing issue, a color issue, a value issue, all of the components that go into creating our paintings. Um, the why comes along later, that's your personality. That's your motive, is it an emotional motive, is it an intellectual motive? Uh, that will begin to fuse with the how and though, when, you begin, when you become a more mature painter, you'll recognize the uh, unity, the connection, the dovetailing between those two. So um, maybe we can get started right off by showing you my materials, which are all right here. It's a fairly thorough, complete uh, representation of my, uh, all of the gear I use, whether I'm out on location or in the studio. So we'll start over here at the brushes, and I've got them lined up in, their, in the sequence of their style, uh, or categories of the style, rather. And over here to the far um, left are the filberts, and I use quite a number of them. So I, uh, large filberts for blocking in, medium filberts, which are really a workhorse, and then these small filberts. And I've got two or three because oftentimes I'm using different colors and keeping both brushes active. So I have a full array of filberts. Then come my flats. And I, don't, I, I use a few of those, not too, too many, but the chiseled effect that they create is very helpful, particularly in the subject that we're going to be dealing with here, these ledges and rocks. Flat brushes are excellent for that. Then a series of rounds for both linear work and more detailed. Uh, a couple of badger hairs for um, blending, uh, edge manipulation, softening passages. Uh, they go all the way down to fairly small brushes. And then I've got more badger hairs, and these, this, this grouping right here is for all of the detail, fine line work, delicate passages. So as you can see, I go from here to here. And as the famous painter Delacroix said, you begin with a broom and you finish with a needle. And uh, I employ that approach to my paintings. Um, Next, I've got, well, of course, my palette knives. I've got one over here, both my palette knives that I use. Um, in addition to that, here's a mall stick. Right now, it's in three pieces, but I'll assemble it into one. This has been my companion since I was 18 years old when I bought it for art school. Uh, and then I use two bridges. It's not likely I'll use them in this painting. I may, just for the sake of illustrating their use, uh, employ them. These are primarily used for uh, complicated paintings that uh, feature architecture, typically. Um, or because I paint a lot of harbors, um, they're ve a very effective tool when you get into painting sailboats and sailing vessels of various kinds. Um, so I will show you how I use them during the uh, uh, presentation, although they uh, won't be needed extensively 
um, in the nature of this painting. Here's my cup for my thinner or my mineral spirits. That's been with me a long time too. Um, I always use a buffer cream on my hands to protect my hands from the to any toxicity in the paint. I use uh, a liquid alkyd medium and I also use a galkid gel. And I will use the gel in the, some of the bold um, applications of this painting that we're going to do together. Um, brush cleaner. Take care of your brushes. <laughs> and they'll take care of you. Uh, it is important to take care of brushes after a good long painting session. Give them a clean. Make sure you get all the water out of them and give them a rest. Um, now we can go over to colors. And um, I can show you very quickly ultramarine blue, cobalt blue. I'm going to go this way. Getting things backwards here. Uh, I actually use three greens, viridian, green earth, which is specific to Rembrandt. It has some unique characteristics. It's, it's got a strong chromatic uh, power in that. Other, other green earths don't feature that. Sap green, cad yellow light, cad yellow medium. Then I interrupt it with a couple of earth yellows, yellow ochre, raw sienna. Now to the reds, cad red light, cad red medium, or deep, they're quite synonymous, and alizarin crimson. And I finish off with four earth tones. And that is burnt sienna, burnt umber, raw umber, and a strange color, again unique to Rembrandt, called greenish umber. There are other manufacturers of that color by name, but the, the characteristics of them are dramatically different than this. So this is very specific and unique to me. Um, a couple of whites. Uh, titanium white, this happens to be quick dry white, which I like very much, particularly when I'm on location. Um, but also because I, I do apply quite a bit of, I hate to say detail, but implied detail or information in my paintings. And I like the paint to set up fairly quickly. I will use um, the quick dry white and another called warm white, which is a convenience color or utility color. Um, I'll talk about that when we look at the palette. Uh, now, this is a drawing kit that I usually carry with me, and it's comprised of uh, charcoal and, and white chalk. I do a lot of drawings on a gray paper, especially thumbnail sketches. Um, and so the black charcoal and the white chalk act as the darks and the lights, and the gray paper functions as the middle gray. So it's a very effective technique. I've got a couple of ebony pencils, um, the graphites. Uh, markers, uh, the grayscale markers, I carry four of them. Often do planning sketches, thumbnails, using those on white paper. And then the typical sandpaper bar, kneaded erasers, and then this tool right here, calipers, which is uh, very important, very helpful for measuring on a painting. Now we move over here. I'm kind of tool laden, but I've always worked this way. I started at working this way as an illustrator, and I always found that I, I want every tool that I, I may possibly need at my disposal. So a couple of 30-60 triangles for measuring angles and doing drawings, particularly again in the architectural realm or if there's something that's human made. A, a proportion wheel makes it very easy if you've got field sketches and you want to enlarge them to a particular size. It's just you can line up the smaller size and it'll tell you what size it is on the large end. I've had this thing for 30 years. Uh, this is, this is so similar to the calipers. It's just a, uh, an implement for measuring angles. Of course, a ruler. Underneath all of it is my pad of gray paper. And then finally, viewfinders. And I have a number of these. This is a standard one that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It can be opened and closed to various proportions. And it has a hole in the center for uh, color identification. Uh, these are handmade, and I have a grid on them. Um, because I use a grid very often. Uh, I, I don't think I'm going to need the grid for this particular painting. We're going to put a few hash marks around just to mark some halves and quarters in the corners. I'll show you that. And then I'll, I'll judge the placement of the uh, elements in the scene from there. But if I do, if the scene does is complex and does require a real visual scrutiny, then I will actually use these on location. And I will put the same grid that you see here right on my drawing paper and eventually back in the studio 
onto my canvas and literally plot it from one step to the next. Um, so there are three of those. There is this that I keep in my box. Honestly, I don't use it all that often, but I think you probably all know what this is. It's for judging values. And um, if there are two elements, land and sea, uh, sea and sky, which oftentimes can be very close in value, and you're not quite sure which, which is which, which is lighter or darker, by placing this in front of your eyes, it removes all color, everything comes into the magenta range, and the only thing left for you to discern is the value. So uh, I, I keep this handy as well. So that is my setup there. I can show you now how my palette is arranged, and I've been arranging my palette this way since I was about 19 or 20 years old. And um, uh, I strongly encourage you to have an organized palette. Place your, place your colors in the same place every time you go to work. They become your piano keys. It really speeds up your pace of painting and um, uh, gives you uh, under understanding and clarity as to what colors are doing what in the, in the mixing arena here. So I'm just putting out the whites right now and then I'll describe each color. I'm going to repeat myself from what's here, but I also want to add something to that description. And that is that my palette is built primarily uh, <laughs> of the primaries, a little redundant. <laughs> uh, two blues, two yellows, two reds. I expand those by having different temperatures of each of those primaries. Now, of course, I've got the secondaries with the greens present here. And then I fill out the rest of my color array with earth tones. I'm, I find earth tones to be very efficient in the field. Um, and of course, they've got a kinship. They're not called earth colors for nothing. Uh, so I find them in the landscape. I even find a lot of them in the seascape subject matter. So it, but it's basically a simple palette. It's two temperatures of each primary, one secondary, and then the rest of the uh, colors present are in the earth tones. So that's where we are as far as equipment and being ready to go. So um, I'm going to get out a pencil, put a couple of marks on one of these. Uh, while we're looking at it, I can uh, present to you that this, of course, is the color reference I'm going to be using. Uh, I'm going to make another version of this painting. The color here is a bit diminished because it's a photographic print, um, but because of visual memory, which we're going to talk about, uh, I'm able to recall the color intensities that may not be quite obvious here. That's just a compromise of this format. Um, and then I had a black and white print made as well so that you and I can share value structure and the, and the importance of placing values for uh, creating the dimension uh, in a painting. Um, but before the dimension comes in a painting, the design has to appear. You go from two dimensions to three dimensions. Uh, my, one of my definitions of a painting is that it is a two-dimensional object. It's got height and width with a th that hosts a three-dimensional illusion. So first we build the height and width in the graphics, uh, the graphic shapes in our composition, in our design, and then we begin to push and pull and open the painting up so it has a depth of field. The, the action that would be present uh, in the painting from the nature of the sea, that has more to do with the movement of the brush, and you'll, that'll become pretty evident when we begin. So I'm going to take a pencil and put a few marks down here, and then we'll get going on the painting. And thanks again for joining me. It's great to have you here. All right, I've got my hash marks at halves and quarters over there, and I'm going to repeat the same thing here. So this is a 16 by 20 oil prime linen uh, on high density acid free um, foam board. Uh, I, I love the surface. It's a portrait grade surface. I've worked on it for years and years and years. So the grid, which I mentioned earlier, is a very important and effective tool. 
And even though some might find it rather rudimentary and something for basic uh, beginners or novices perhaps, or people that uh, need assistance in developing their drawings, um, I have been doing this a long time and I still employ it. It is very uh, effective. And what I like about it is it takes the guesswork out of drawing and it adds great efficiency to your, that's the, your time usage, which is very important. I'll do it this way. Easier than counting backwards. I'm kind of a stickler about using my time wisely. I think it probably came from my years as an illustrator. Um, and so I, at times, still employ it. Again, I'm not doing it right now. I'm going to just use these as reference points and uh, visually match up where these components are going to uh, eventually land. Um, it's the other reason that the grid is effective is that um, it has the orientation. This sounds obvious, but it's to the, the, the vertical and the horizontal. And instead of measuring all the way across your canvas, you can actually just measure section by section. So uh, that's enough of that. So before I actually start to put an underpainting on here, I just want to talk about the sea for a moment. Um, of course, the theme in this presentation is moving water. Um, I'm sure those of you out there who have been in, uh, have attempted or su and succeeded or not at painting water, whether it be flat or whether it be moving, have recognized its unique characteristics and the fact that it can be a challenging subject to, to handle. Um, one of the uh, things to be aware of is that when your, your chosen subject has a kinetic nature, which water obviously does, you're going to have to understand it at a deeper level than if you were to simply go out and paint a landscape that's not moving or a cityscape or whatever scene it is. But if you're going to paint a subject that has a kinetic nature, locomotion, such as equine art, you have to understand the way a horse moves, uh, the anatomy of a horse, any other, top, any other subject that, um, has, that, um, that is, has locomotion and moves requires a deeper body of knowledge. So I've been watching the sea since I was a boy. I've been sitting by the shore where I spent my summers and now live in Booth Bay, Maine, East Booth Bay. And I was kind of a witness to it, just anecdotally, just watching what it did. And um, I started to build uh, understanding of its, of its, uh, of its nature. Um, we're going to go over a little schematic here in a moment or two um, after we start the underpainting. Um, but I invite you to begin to study the sea, not simply by uh, going to the shore and painting it. And if you do that, you must invest yourself in actually watching it for extended periods of time. Um, trying to rely on a snap single photograph is very difficult to get the movement of a sea. Um, and uh, I don't happen to use photography. I work in a very kind of old fashioned way. I'll talk about the evolution of my subject here in that regard in a moment. But if you're inclined to use more technology to document your subject matter, I have <laughs> certainly have no objection to it. Uh, it's, uh, everyone is entitled and, uh, and should pursue their own uh, creative path with the tools that they choose to uh, utilize. Um, so video cameras would stop action and you can analyze the movement of a wave. If you find that helpful, wonderful. The only thing I would suggest is don't shortchange yourself from the time you actually spend witnessing the sea or water, be it a waterfall, a moving river, white water uh, rivers are wonderful places to study because the water breaks the very same way over and over and over and you can study its paths. Uh, just don't shortchange yourself from being a first-hand witness to it. Um, that leads us to where this painting came from. Um, this was done from this is a place called Otter Cliff, Cliffs up in uh, Mount Desert, Maine, Acadia National Park. And uh, a, a breaking storm, moving weather, the light is beginning to break after a very stormy night, actually a couple of days. I was perched on a cliff with my watercolor sketch pad 
and um, some charcoal and some paper. And I just began to do studies of a feature here and a feature there. I'd share those with you if I still had them. They've been kind of long gone. But they were my initial working tools. So between those initial tools and the time I spent, I went back here two days in a row just to continue to watch and absorb it. Again, no camera. It's just I prefer to work directly with the materials in my hands until I thought I had a pretty good understanding of two things. One is the uh, geographical uh, or geological, really, um, uh, relation, uh, uh, nature of these cliffs. And then secondly, the rhythm and the movement of the water, how these were f rolling in, settling, and then rising up and crashing on it. When I felt I had a sufficient uh, um, body of knowledge from which to uh, extract or glean the information I wanted, I left the location. I went back to my studio and then did a drawing, black and white, uh, very similar to this, and that was my departure point. Um, the watercolor had a little bit of color in it, but not enough to really rely on, so I was making color notes as I was there studying. So I'm taking all these disparate pieces of information and assembling them, and they eventually resulted in this composition. Um, this atmosphere, these weather conditions, again, if you're going to paint the sea, you'll get used to the weather. And it's, it, that's another very important thing to study. Study weather systems. Study cloud formations. Begin to get a, a, a familiarity, a kinship with the subject. So you, it becomes, uh, you could be dramatic and say part of you, but it's just something that you're familiar with. You could look out there on any given day if you're by the show and say, oh, I know what just happened or I know what's about to happen. So that's just a couple of little notes on... Um, you, what you're in for <laughs> in painting the sea. Um, so let's get started here. Now, uh, I'm going to start in a rather, it might surprise some of you who don't, haven't watched me work or, pardon my tapping there, that's the liquid. There's something that scares each and every one of us and that's a, a white rectangle. <laughs> We're going to take that and create a dramatic illusion on it. Um, so I like to get rid of the white rectangle as fast as possible. And I do it with a paper towel and some liquid and by rubbing some tone into the canvas, into the linen rather. We'll call it, we'll call it what it is. Um, now underpainting, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, variation and a lot of different um, approaches to what underpainting. A lot of uh, artists uh, tone their canvases with what they would consider to be primarily a complementary color. Uh, others will tone the canvases with, um, uh, within the warm range. Uh, the warm range meaning it's very common to see painters stain their canvases with burnt sienna or raw umber. Um, and then in the complementary range, you'll see them You often use uh, magenta. What I do is I do an underpainting, what I call a sympathetic or a harmonious underpainting, and it is specific to the painting I'm working on. So without doing any careful drawing, I just begin to assign certain colors in certain areas without any, uh, too much pressure about uh, whether the masses that I'm putting in in the underpainting are going to exactly line up with the drawing that I will eventually uh, put down. So first thing I'm going to do is rub in that underpainting, then I'm going to do a drawing on top, a linear armature, to get the uh, shapes that I'm interested in capturing. And then from there, then I'll begin to build the body paint. Uh, be care being careful about my value structure, always keeping that in mind. Um, there's a lot of atmospheric perspective in this, a lot of depth in this. So making sure the value relationships, which is why it is very helpful to have this, um, will uh, begin to give me the depth that I'm looking for. So without further ado, and by the way, I do not use white. I keep, even though it's on the palette, I stay away from it as I'm putting in the underpainting. And there's nothing absolutely sacrosanct. This doesn't have to be perfect in, in its color. It's just within a range of something that it, uh, is going to be, as I say, in harmony with what I want that, uh, the colors I want that area to feature. The other thing this does is it just kind of warms me up. It's a little bit of an artistic calisthenic, you know, doing a few jumping jacks before you, before you start your, your 
your workout or your athletic endeavor. It's a little familiarization. The liquid does have a fairly strong scent to it. So in my studio at home, I run a uh, very, very uh, good air filter that's positioned right next to my easel. So that gets turned on the minute the paint gets opened up. I have evolved into doing this kind of underpainting in the last, oh, six or seven years, I think. Um, and the, just for expeditiousness, I just wanted to get going on the, on the painting and not get too terribly bogged down with drawing right off the bat. Oftentimes I'd put a drawing down and then tone my canvas and it uh, finally occurred to me that toning the canvas after the drawing down was not a very efficient way to do it. <laughs> the drawing rapidly disappears. Going from that yellow, from the, using the raw sienna, which has quite a bit of red in it, into this lavender tone. And the buffer cream I use is why I'm not concerned about holding a paper towel with oil paint and thinner on and medium on it. And in fact, I'm going to take a second and reapply it because I'm not sure I showed you that. I put it on first thing when I start. Um, this comes in different brands. I stick my fingertips in it. Same with this hand. And just rub it into the t ends of your fingers. Never hurts to put on extra. Um, I attempted to paint with gloves on once and it uh, didn't suit me at all. I felt like I was too detached from the... From the um, the brush, but however, I, I have so many colleagues that uh, do paint that way, so um, if you can handle it, that's great. Again, just approximations. I'm not, not getting terribly bogged down with whether anything's going to line up perfectly. And I start this as I would a watercolor. I work in watercolor quite a bit. I also work in gouache and a paint called uh, casein, which is a, a milk-based tempera, very old-fashioned paint. I started using that as an illustrator. Um, and I, I, still, I still paint with it. It's lovely paint. It's kind of a combination of um, uh, gouache and oil paint. So the more I can remove that uh, white, I'm, you, you almost immediately begin to feel uh, that you're getting involved in the painting, even just psychologically. Because those white canvases are foreign. I'm looking around for suggestions. And it's not uncommon at all for my underpainting to appear uh, in the final uh, conclusion of the work. I'm, I'm very fond of oil paint for a lot of reasons, but one of them is because of its textural, a tactile diversity. It can go from a very thin wash to thick impastos, and that range of paint application can be really exciting and intriguing. So lots of gr muted grays and purples in this painting. By the way, with the heavy mist that was present, I was soaked <laughs> after uh, each of those sessions. And there was another wonderful thing that happened. 
Uh, I'm taking a very rough uh, eyeball here of the, um, uh, looking at the halfway point and seeing that uh, that purple landfall in the back, you know, if you can place, use a little bit of placement, doesn't hurt. It's going to get you closer to where you want to go. So it was that heavy drenched air. So I got soaked both of the days I was there. And the other really enjoyable thing uh, that happened to me was, uh, it was on the first day. Um, I was sitting there very still, just sketching away, very studious, paying attention. And to my left, and I had a sandwich and a granola bar or something. And because I was sitting there so at peace, at ease, and not moving really much except for my hand, um, a big black back seagull uh, made himself at home. He sat about two or three feet from me. And then he saw my food and he came up closer. And he sat as my companion about two, two and a half feet away from me for an hour and a half. It was really remarkable. Wonderful feeling. Of course, he did get a granola bar out of the deal, so uh, seemed only right. Now I can take, just take a quick look and say, okay, that's about uh, eight, uh, let's see, we've got a quote, about an eighth of the way in, so this land mass comes in here. By the way, I'm using the shop towel. I like these a lot, the blue shop towels. They're particularly good for this technique that I'm using right now. Um, oh, a little, little red got caught up in there, but not to worry. That's easily easily dealt with. And just checking, that's a little over to here, so I know that that jog is right in there somewhere. So believe it or not, as, even though this is a very, very, very basic tool, you can actually get a little drawing done with it as well. I, I know that because um, I'm very grateful, really grateful for the fact that there are people that know me as a marine painter and seascape painter, uh, in spite of the fact that I um, ha handle a lot of other subjects, as I was saying before, mountains, deserts. But clearly, my the body of my life's work has been dedicated to this subject. And when they, if they see me, if they're a student of mine, or they see me work, and they see me start my paintings with a paper towel, they're kind of taken aback because I put a lot of information into my paintings and they find it a little bit difficult to believe that um, the first application of paint on my canvases, linens, <laughs> canvas is such a generic term, I've been saying it for too long, after, after five or six decades, <laughs> can't break the habit. But every painting has to start in the large passages. As Delacroix said, you begin with the broom and, um, and finish with the needle. So it's the, lar it's the breadth of the piece. It's the breadth of the work of art that has to be established first, uh, regardless of any of the detail that you might want to include or develop on the surface. And, and this, this helps me with that breadth uh, of... Uh, of single vision to just put the thing in there with some masses and some solidity. Unification is always more important than separation in a painting. So just by getting some tone on here and beginning to very nascent stages of unification in the, in the scene. And even with this, this portrait linen, even with this, it, it requires some scrubbing to get all of those little spots addressed. Now, if you don't like this approach, by all means, don't bother with it. Um, uh, you could just as easily pre-tone canvases and develop your work that way. That's why I said the way I happen to approach my work is the least important of the things that I want to share with you.
begin to touch upon some of the foam shadow areas, approximations. Viridian is a real workhorse for me. I've been using it for years. It's a very, very cool green bordering on blue. You'll see me using a lot of it in here. I'm going to need to resupply the liquid. I've moved over to cobalt and cad red. I think I said medium to you earlier, but it's actually cad red deep. But I know I said they're, they're pretty much synonymous. They're very, very similar. Um, the key to all of them is the temperature. You know, it's clearly there's a temperature shift from here to here. But if I had cad red medium lined up next to this cad red deep, you wouldn't see a great uh, difference. Now, obviously, this, this closer ledge is going to have a dark, deeper, warmer tone to it. I can take a very quick measurement and look that it's just below, just below middle, midway, and about halfway between these right here. So it's out in here somewhere. and rising up to about halfway there. Got to find my upper mark. If I lose it, I'm going to put it back in, which I did. So let's go find it. I wiped it out with a little paint. There we go. And I'm back up in here, so this comes up quite high. and drops down about halfway here and just about to that corner. This is a, just a 1620, but it still takes a little while to get this dealt with. But I've seen many a painter begin drawing with a white canvas and what they run into is these primarily uh, folks that I've had in workshops. They've already mentally segmented the painting. Uh, I'll, an example, there'll, there'll be a field and a tree or two and perhaps a building in the distance, some rural scene. And they begin to create, paint the scene object to object. It's very difficult to get a unified painting. And ultimately, even though we build our paintings in pieces, the ultimate goal is to have a single unified image. So um, we should think of paintings as all of the shadows being connected and all of the highlights being connected and remove that idea of separation. So um, that's one of the reasons why I, bought, I, I, I approach it this way, so that I'm going to avoid any of that possibility of segmented parts. This, this guy is stubborn. I'm going to get him to, I'm going to get him to show up one way or another. And there we are. And there we are. Because I want a reference point right here. Halfway there and comes almost right here. So it's right about in here somewhere. And 
Now, I know we said this demonstration is about the sea, but uh, so many great marine painters through, the, through history that are my heroes. And um, Emil Gruppi from the Rockport area painted very dynamic, exciting seas. Um, and he said, you've got to make a choice. Is the painting about the land or the sea or the sky? You've got to pick one. Otherwise, you'll have conflicting ideas in front of you. But the sea requires a supporting cast, and that supporting cast is the, uh, the cliffs that it is crashing upon. Now I'll begin to underpaint the sea. And my primary, or my, my starting color is going to be the Viridian. Combined with a cad red. I'm going to go a little deeper and a little bit more neutralized. This is a combination, if you're taking no, co notes about color for painting the sea. Um, I never have a formula. I, the, the sea changes so much under every circumstance and in every location you go to. I've painted a lot of seas uh, off the coast of Maine. That speaks for itself. I've also painted the sea off of southern New England where the color is dramatically different. And you work your way down the eastern seaboard, of course, you get to Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. It's an entirely different palette. Um, the, um, the color of the sea around New York City is interesting. <laughs> it's kind of yellow ochre. <laughs> uh, um, then the West Coast, because of the, the marine life and the, um, the growth, the, and the, 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 bio, the biology of the, the makeup of the sea, um, again, an entirely different palette. These colors emerge because of the sea life that's growing below. Also the angle of the sun. We've got to wedge down in here under that little shelf that holds the painting in place. It always leaves that nice white stripe when you're done. So painting the sea requires a feeling, a rhythm. And even with the paper towel, I will begin to move my arm in the motion of the sea. I'm going to do a little schematic for you on wave anatomy here uh, at some point when I, when I f feel it's an appropriate time. Um, It's the rise and the fall of the sea. It's moving away a little bit, so we'll add a little bit of blue to it. Not because that's a universal rule. We can talk about, we will talk about that. That atmospheric perspective, there's a misconception that um, everything, uh, all objects turn cooler in the, uh, in the distance through atmospheric perspective, and that is not accurate. Some do happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. I've been on the West Coast, and I've been um, 
in the mountains, in the the furthest thing in the in the uh, in the in the what the scene I was witnessing was the warmest. So it depends upon the particulars of the place. So even now, I'm tr- beginning to move my arm in kind of a figure eight motion. Let's let's pick a spot here. So this wave rolls over this way, con convex. Then it, then it becomes concave and rises up. It sees always this, this one in the foreground. I'm going to see where it lines up. It's just about at the quarter mark, which is there. That's down here. So I was talking about the rise of a wave, crests and breaks. You're going to hear me say that a lot. Then another touch or two, a little bit more of the, um, if anybody's wondering what those two things are, they're nothing. (laughs) Just a couple of marks. There's an important shadow that runs out through there. That's an important compositional element. So let's get, let's play with that a little bit. This time I'm using a little bit of alizarin. Cobalt. If the color is a little strong and direct, that's okay for now. It's going to be painted over anyway. Right about at the halfway comes that comes that color. I can add a little viridian to it. Viridian and uh, cobalt they actually create a uh, something similar to a cerulean blue. Another color combination to make note of. Cobalt and the lizard. I'm going to squint a little bit at this and looking for a general impression. Yeah, that's more the tone I'm looking for in there, a little bit deeper. There'll be quite a bit of that in this passage. There, and that about wraps up the the underpainting. Nothing magical, nothing magnificent, but what we're not dealing with anymore is that white rectangle. (laughs) Now we've made our first investment into our painting. I'm Don Demers. I'm very pleased to have you with me today. So thank you for coming and joining me for this presentation. It's wonderful to have you join me. You know, we spend so much of our painting careers by ourselves uh, in isolation, um, what I call solitary refinement, that it's uh, a lot of fun and rewarding to have you here. I hope I can contribute to your uh, to your uh, creative process and your creative journey. I'm primarily known as a marine painter slash seascape painter. I think that's the reason you're here watching because you're interested in painting the sea and water and all of its uh, various aspects. The way I hope to teach you to capture the movement of water is not only through observation, which is very important, but also from a, almost a scientific understanding to break it down into its component parts to begin to understand what the forces are on Earth that move water, break them down, discuss them both theoretically, and then apply that to our drawing and our painting. Although the characteristics of painting moving water are unique unto itself, the way I approach a painting can really be applied to any subject whatsoever. It starts with design, value consideration, rhythm, pattern, And I break it down step by step so that you can understand and digest it as we go along and build your paintings. I think the thing that is most exciting about this video for you is that you will never have the same relationship with the sea or water uh, again. You will never look at a lake again. You'll never be by the seashore again or be uh, along a riverbank. 
and not view the water with more respect and engagement and excitement. And if you can begin to have a relationship with the water in all of its forms, it will transform your paintings to a level that will make them exceptional in any space. Hi there, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. Welcome to Interviews with the Artist. Today we have a fabulous artist for you to meet. His name is Don Demers. Don, welcome. Thanks, Eric. It's good to be here with you. It's been a while. It has been a while. Now, I'm trying to think about when we first met, and I, I'm not sure. It was back east somewhere, and it, it may have been... It may have been at a workshop or something the Plein Air Painters of America put on. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember exactly when it occurred. It was a while, it was 20 years ago. Yeah, at least. It was some time ago. Yeah. Um, I became a member of uh, Plein Air Painters of America around 2004, um, somewhere in there. Uh, I honestly don't remember. The last, I do remember being with Plein Air Painters of America in Mount Desert up in Acadia with you. We had a good week up there. Maybe that's where we really got to know each other. We got so. to know each other there. We'd met prior to that. Um, I was in Monterey with you at the uh, second convention, that's I think. That's right. Yeah. That's right. With John Stobart. Uh, oh, classic. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> that was fun. Well, you uh, have had a really terrific career, and I want to kind of dig into that, but let's first go back to the very, very beginning, because I like to understand the roots. Um, I, I recently read something that uh, psychiatrists say that pretty much anything that happens before you're 10 years old kind of determines your track in life, mm -hmm. or at least how you, how you interpret the world or your lens. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, growing up and where you grew up, and when you kind of first started thinking about art. Huh. Uh, by the way, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's well. very flattering and um, uh, humbling when you're asked about your life and what you're doing with it. So I'm very appreciative of that, and I want to thank you for it. Um, I grew up in central Massachusetts in a farm town in a big old white farmhouse. My dad was a bricklayer uh, and had uh, four brothers. Um, so it was a rough-and-tumble household. Um, we, we got to go on vacation to Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, for two weeks every summer because my grandparents had a little cottage up there. And I started drawing in, uh, when, when I was so young, I barely remember it. But I do remember this. My mother and father had an in-home office, basically a desk and a filing cabinet. My mom kept the books for my dad's masonry business. And I used to sneak in there and steal the paper and even envelopes to do drawings on. And I, <laughs> I remember my mother and my father both scolding me. Donnie, that's not what that paper's for. <laughs> so I just started drawing. I, it was um, kind of a second language for me. I had some in, inexplicable want and need to draw things. And of course, when I was a little kid, so they were... Uh, jet planes and trains and trucks and superheroes and monsters and all that kind of stuff that <laughs> from being in the uh, early 60s, yeah. anything that was m inspiring me from the television or the from Bat comic Mobile. books. Uh, the Batmobile I drew many <laughs> times from every angle, all that stuff. So it was always just part of my way of communicating. Uh -huh. And it never occurred to me not to do it. And it wasn't long before I was eight or nine or ten years old, and my family referred to me, oh, Donna, he's the artist. So huh. it just stuck. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how your, your uh, how, how would they say that, that became your self-worth or your, it gave you confidence, you identified as an artist. At that Very point. much so. Yeah. Very much so. It was something that my other brothers couldn't do. And, uh, of course, we all played sports. We beat each other up. We yeah. built tree houses. We ran, you know, ran through the woods and the orchards and all that. So I did all of that with them, but that was my thing. And was there farming involved? You said you lived on a far in a farmhouse. Well, there were apple orchards everywhere. We didn't operate one, but there was one across the street, and there was one just down the road a little bit. So we, we volunteered to 
uh, every harvest season, everybody in the neighborhood, we all picked apples. Uh, the, the teenagers got to use the ladders. Runts like me had to pick the, pick the drops off the ground and uh, put them in the wooden boxes. And my father drove a big trailer truck and everybody lined them up. And it was, fun. It was a great way what to grow up. What a great childhood. It was. It was wonderful, wonderful. So what happened? Uh, uh, how did your art um, progress? You, you go into school, high school. Did you take art classes or anything like that? Well, there was something that, that uh, happened prior to that, and that was my mom was an amateur painter, and, uh, and my aunt Jean, her sister, was also an amateur painter, but they were good, my aunt particularly. She still paints. She's 92, and she's still painting away. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's great. And um, so I was around the oil paints, and um, so I, I saw the materials. I remember a big coffee table book that came, uh, my aunt had it, of uh, Andrew Wyeth paintings. And that was that. And I, I started to stare at that. And because we were in Booth Bay in the summer, I was very young. I don't remember exactly what age, 10-ish, somewhere in there. And went to the Farnsworth. My aunt took me there. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw Wyeth paintings for the first time, and that planted the seed. Mm. And then when I was in the sixth grade, I was given a paint-by-number. <laughs> I'm not boring you with this, but... Paint by number for Christmas from some aunt that I can't even remember who it was. And it was of two Cocker Spaniels. And I couldn't wait to get that thing done. And then I thought, well, that looks kind of stupid. I'm going to blend the edges. So, <laughs> so I turned it into a much more realistic picture just by blending the edges from the spaces. And then I had a lot of paint left over. So I put the Cocker Spaniels aside and I painted a seascape. <laughs> really? Still have that painting? Uh, it may be in the attic of the old house because my youngest brother still lives in the house. It might be up there somewhere. Right. So I was, I was just oriented toward the materials, the well, tools. Well, you need to get that because it's going to go in the Smithsonian <laughs> someday. <laughs> Maybe in some pet museum somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yes, high school. And I had the greatest benefit of having an absolutely wonderful high school art teacher. Her name was Neldy Drum, and she was a taskmaster. And I, I spent every spare minute in, uh, I was either shooting street hockey balls in the gymnasium with my brothers because we all played ice hockey, or I was in the art room. And I spent an inordinate amount of time with her in there. And did, did you, were you kind of like the star student? Because yeah. Because you had a lot of yep. experience drawing? I worked the hardest. I loved it the most. I was in there constantly. Mm -hmm. So I had a key to the art room. I, sub I bought the supplies for the high school <laughs> <laughs> art program, and, and she stuck up for me and stood by my side and gave me uh, pretty much free reign through uh, my four years of high school. And what, what do you think you were, do you remember what you were doing? Were you painting? Were you doing a little bit of everything? Uh, I was kind of a snob. Um, you know, we had, uh, you had to do some jewelry classes and, and some sculpture activities to fulfill the requirements of the class and I just look at Mrs. Drum and she says just just go paint. <laughs> so <laughs> she said I know you don't want to do those other things just do what you're interested in doing. So I was painting outside. I was doing outdoor landscape work. You were work. really? Yeah, I go up behind the high school into the woods and paint and um, I also did a lot of still lives. Um, uh, some work from photographs you know peeling stuff out of National Geographic and all that kind of thing and uh -huh. doing figures in the paintings and all, anything I could get my hands on. Oh, a lot of, a lot of uh, sporting art, a lot of hockey scenes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting that you went outdoors. Um, had, was this a, you know, an idea that you had on your own or had you seen an example of somebody going outdoors that gave you the idea? You know, Not that I recall. Pictures of Monet or something? And nope, I just did it on my own. Yeah. I loved being outside. My, we grew up with the uh, German Shepherds, and my one favorite German Shepherd is Marco. And so I take my paint box, and I take Marco, and we go into the woods for the whole day. And um, I still have some of those paintings. Do you? Yeah. yeah. And I just set up. I was a very contemplative kid. Part of me was active and social and gregarious, but I had a very contemplative side to me. I wanted to be by myself. And um, I'd go out into those woods and set up my paint box and... Swamp Marco mosquitoes. would run around and sit by my side and I'd paint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah lots of that. <laughs> so yeah. it, you learned the lesson of outdoor painting at a young age. Uh, you know, this is a, an issue that I have. There's not a right or wrong, but, you know, there, there are people who have spent their entire life painting from photographs or painting in the studio, 
and never have gone outside to paint in the light. Yeah. And that changes everything. Everything changes. Absolutely everything changes. Uh, there's such a barrier, and I don't want to criticize or uh, uh, diminish anyone who chooses to work from photography. The beautiful thing about the creative endeavors is every one of them is custom fit to yeah. who, whoever that person is. But for, I became aware um, of the fact that you know we're, we're multi-sensory beings and we're binocular and we're bipeds and we live in a spherical world and we're walking into that world with all of these influences and these, as I was saying in my recent video that um, people look at the sea and they think of waves. Well, what they're missing is the fact that it's an in, invisible energy source that has a frequency and an oscillation that's moving the water. At the same time, we walk outside, there's sound waves and light waves that are coming at us. There's energy coming to us. And if you experience it in its full dimension by being in it, it completely changes your, your perceptions. See, and I've never heard it articulated in that way. I never really thought about that. Huh. Uh, but it, you know, the essence of what you're saying is so important because, and, and I, of course I experienced it, and of course I published Plein Air Magazine, which is all about going outdoors, but that the idea of capturing that essence, you know, that, that vibration of light, mm -hmm. um, and, and also the senses, you know, everything's about a sensory experience, and to have, the, you know, the wind blowing and the birds singing and the dogs barking or whatever, it just all informs kind of the, the essence of the scene. It absolutely does. In the summertime when you hear that, that cricket chirping, it, any of that is affecting your fingertips. Yeah. And it's coming in here, your two, your two intelligence centers, your heart and your mind. Mm -hmm. And it's traveling down there. It's informing it. And I've said to my students, if they're working from photographs, be careful of that because that's like kissing through a screen door. <laughs> you're damn close, but you're not there. <laughs> you just have that, that little obstruction that's keeping you from being in the full thing. That's so. a really great analogy. <laughs> Well, that's that's kind of interesting to to think about that. I you know I I never really I, I I never could articulate the difference between a photograph and painting outdoors, but you just said it perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, I've done both. As an illustrator, I had to rely on photography. Yeah. You know, and and um, and if you have a sense of um, if you can cultivate a sense of your own presence, boy, you can feel it. Yeah. It's just so different when you're outside um, with the full experience instead of a, a, a truncated or an abbreviated experience. Yeah. So you, uh, you go to high school, you're the star pupil. What happens then? I, I won the high school art award. I got 600 bucks. Wow. That was a big deal. Wow. Was a, well, <laughs> it was a big deal was a in big 1974. Deal. 1974. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's six, 600 bucks is a lot of it money. It meant a lot. That was a lot of gasoline for my Impala. <laughs> <laughs> you had an Impala. 1966. <laughs> I had a 68 Impala. <laughs> Have it in common. Yeah, a 306. Uh, Got see, me around being cool. <laughs> yeah. I get it. So, uh, <clears throat> so you win the 600 bucks. You are now empowered. You, you, know, you now have this extra bolt of confidence. Mm -hmm. What happens? I went to art school in Worcester, Massachusetts, the school of the Worcester Art Museum. The best thing about that school was it was uh, physically and, and institutionally linked to the um, Worcester Art Museum, which is a wonderful museum, exceptional collection for a museum of that size. Um, and it didn't go well. Um, the, the, the culture of art education at that time was to be um, uh, socially conscious, conceptual, avant-garde. There was no craft taught, or very little. Um, I was not happy at all. I was the schools at that time were almost anti-craft. Absolutely. I was actually told by one of my instructors in front of the class, well, we have someone in the class who, ha who is handicapped. And I knew he was speaking about me because I had just had a consultation with him the day before, and he was quite specific about it. So he saw me as being pretty inadequate and actually flawed because I was interest, interested in classic portrayal 
That's interesting because I had a very similar experience. I uh, I didn't start painting till I was 40, but my wife bought me an art lesson at the local art center, and I went in, and the guy is saying, you know, just express yourself, throw yeah. the paint on the canvas, and I said, well, can, you know, can you teach me? I want to learn like how to paint a bottle or a flower or, or <laughs> exactly. something. And he said, oh, nobody does that anymore. Yeah. That's been done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I faced the exact same thing. It was made worse because the cast of instructors that I faced had their own personal agendas. So they were trying to make you a minion or an acolyte of what they were doing instead of recognizing your individuality. So I didn't last very long in that school. I lasted a year and a half. Um, I did get to play some college hockey, which was great because they were associated with Clark University. So I played college hockey for Clark. <laughs> um, and then I eventually, I had a little interim time. Um, and then I ended up at the Massachusetts College of Art as a painting major. Uh, I was a triple major. I worked very hard, very hard. What uh, were your majors? Painting, illustration, and graphic design. Oh, my. And I fought that faculty like crazy to allow me to have all. I said, I'll do the work if you let me do it. And again, not to, I sound like I'm being a little bit too negative here, but the administration said, you can't be a painting and an illustration major. They have nothing to do with each other. So... Even then, by then, I knew who Rockwell was and who Dean Cornwell was and who N.C. Wyeth was. So, Well, let's talk about that because there was, uh, there, w when I first started publishing Fine Art Connoisseur, somebody said to me, well, don't ever uh, cover somebody like Rockwell. And I said, why? And they said, well, he's not a fine artist, he's an illustrator. Yeah. But he was a fine artist. Of course. A so where, where did this all come from? Well, if they want to go all the way back, they can say that Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci were illustrators because they were being told what to paint. Yeah. <laughs> that's what an illustrator is. Yeah, I guess that's a really good point. So mm -hmm. it's really, it, but, but you, you can tell. I, we talked at dinner last night about me going to a Cornwall and Rockwell exhibit, and those guys could paint circles around anybody. Absolutely. You know, the subject matter was commercialized, you know, for a cover of a magazine or something, but they were really fine painters. Brilliant painters. Yeah. And my opinion of, of uh, painting is it is not an art, it is a craft. Um, it's, it can become an art if the practitioner is sufficiently qualified. So what, what's the difference? There isn't one. If, if, you, if I had to give a difference, it would be, well, of course, illustration embodies a wide variety of media. You know, you could work in airbrush and pen and ink and mixed media and all that. So that can convolute the definition. But really, the only distinction between illustration and, quote, fine art is that in illustration, you're being directed and instructed by an exterior source. In fine art, in its essence, you're by yourself and you come up with your own ideas. See, I thought you were you were talking about the difference between there's a difference between being a proficient painter and being an artist. Well, I am. So the difference. I, let me let me clarify. The um, to become, I, I consider artist to be a level of achievement, almost a ranking, if you will. Yeah. There are days when I've been an artist. There are days when I've been a picture maker. <laughs> And there's difference. There's a difference. So, so if how you, do you know when you're an artist versus when you're a picture maker? Yeah, you can spot it when you're involved in it and when you're finished. When I, when I am surprised by what it is I've accomplished, that's the, those are the days I'm an artist. Yeah. <laughs> when I already know the outcome at the beginning of the day, then I'm, I'm filling up a canvas. But to be clear, I consider painting to be a craft. And when you're, when you're accomplished enough at your craft, it gives you the opportunity to create art. That gives you the platform. The difference between being a painter and an illustrator, another, a separate question, is that as an illustrator, somebody else is giving you your motivation. Yeah. When you're a fine, quote, fine artist. Um, well, to some extent, somebody in, in that, mm -hmm. even in that environment, to some extent, there's this essence mm -hmm. or the sense that somebody is giving you that because you know, if you're making your living in the back of your mind, you're thinking, uh, I have to sell this. Mm -hmm. And so that influences the way you might, or, or can influence the way 
that you paint. Because Absolutely. You, you know, if, especially if you're desperate to make a living. Uh, you know, I have someone in my family who's an artist who has never sold a piece, has never wanted to sell a piece, and is afraid to sell a piece because he doesn't want it to influence his art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that you ask very insightful, poignant questions and pose positions that are really... Uh, have been omnipresent in my consciousness for the last 40 something years that I've been doing this. Uh, there's a difference between being a painter and making a living as a painter. And, um, and the criteria changes. And um, our dear friend Joe McGurl, he and I have talked about this because we're such dear friends and our kids grew up together. Mm -hmm. And we always talked about the fact that we we're, we're making a living doing this. And some people will agree with what I'm about to say and some people will be ashamed of me for what I'm about to say, but there are internal motives and external motives. And if you've got the, the discipline to compartmentalize those two and recognize them in a, what, and to what degree they're influencing you, you can rest well at night. And you can paint paintings that are not uh, designed for an audience, but that you may know will have uh, a greater appeal. So and what's the difference? Is, is the difference, uh, that's good enough, send it off to sell No, it's it. subject matter. It's never quality of paint. The quality of paint has to be high every time you well, do it. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Because, but, but you know, one, one, if one is a machine, you know, trying to, trying to generate revenue, one could say, well, you know, it's good enough. I can send it out the door. From my perspective, it's like, it, I can't send it out the door. Yeah. It's not, it just, there's something wrong with it. It's not right yet. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the uh, integrity of the craft, that was never once compromised by me. Um, and never I, once? No. Well, if, if perhaps it was, but it was unintentional. It was by okay. mistake. I was too tired or I missed something and that kind of thing. So you never had a gallery say to you, you know, uh, we could sell those sailboat paintings all day long. You know, the ones sitting next to the little red barn. Could you do me 30 of those? You would never do that. Oh, no, no, no. What I'm talking about is the, uh, the, the quality of the craft. The quality. Okay. The quality of the craft was okay. never compromised. All right. If I wanted to do a painting of an old abandoned cement truck versus a cat boat sailing through a marsh, when my kids were little and I had a mortgage to pay, I painted the cat boat sailing through the marsh. Beats cleaning toilets. It does beat cleaning toilets. And there's, Not there's, that there's anything wrong no, with No, there isn't. And I think it was Hawthorne, or one of the great American existentialists, simply said, there's honor in work. Yeah. And I always had that, that tenet in my mind. And it just so happened, I love sailboats and I love marshes, so it wasn't a big deal for me. Yeah, and you're painting. Uh, and I'm painting. Yeah, I mean, right? uh, uh, it can't be a bad day if you're painting. It was even, not. Even if you're painting badly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, did I paint for a market? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the subject, but I, my works were, were greedily consumed by a market down in Cape Cod and Connecticut. And I was just so fortunate mm -hmm. um, that I'd, I happened to love sailing ships and I loved the water and I loved the shoreline. And there was an audience waiting for those pictures, well, and, so I was and, just you know, lucky. And that's very worthy. It's very actually, it's very noble in the sense that you're doing something that people love. They want to own it. They want to hang it on their walls and mm -hmm. look at it, look at it every day. And what can be wrong with that? I didn't really see a negative. Yeah. The, any negatives I got were from some colleagues or acquaintances that I had that thought that I was a sellout or I wasn't a purist or any of that. And I said, "Listen, I'm doing what I want to do, and I'm raising kids." <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Poke at me if you want, but it's not <laughs> bugging me. <laughs>
the reason you're here watching because you're interested in painting the sea and water and all of its uh, various aspects. The way I hope to teach you to capture the movement of water is not only through observation, which is very important, but also from a, almost a scientific understanding to break it down into its component parts, to begin to understand what the forces are on Earth that move water, break them down, discuss them both theoretically, and then apply that to our drawing and our painting. Although the characteristics of painting moving water are unique unto itself, the way I approach a painting can really be applied to any subject whatsoever. It starts with design, value consideration, rhythm, pattern, and I break it down step by step so that you can understand and digest it as we go along and build your paintings. I think the thing that is most exciting about this video for you is that you will never have the same relationship with the sea or water uh, again. You will never look at a lake again, you'll never be by the seashore again or be uh, along a riverbank and not view the water with more respect and engagement and excitement. And if you can begin to have a relationship with the water in all of its forms, it will transform your paintings to a level that will make them exceptional in any space.